I think the biggest hurdle we're going to have to get by is not getting people to operate in the office. It's getting them to the office. And it's not simply about a desk or a turret or an office. It's about coming through the turnstile. It's about the cafeteria. It's about the elevators. We are very happy to continue to imagine and reimagine as we go forward the ways we come to work. But, you know, at our, at our core, we are a client facing client driven business. That's Mike Corbett of Citigroup talking about the single biggest decision he and every CEO around the world is wrestling with right now, when to bring people back to work. Safety is a huge challenge and fears employees have about commuting remain a major obstacle. But as you'll hear, Corbett is gingerly pushing his bank forward into a world reshaped by the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Eric Schatzker, and I connected with Mike Corbett via Zoom for a Bloomberg Front Row interview. The Citigroup CEO has a lot on his mind. Record unemployment, central bank interventions, and the uncertain future of doing business in China. Given what Citigroup went through in the financial crisis, Mike, it's hard not to make comparisons. What lessons are you drawing from that experience and applying now? Well, I think one is that we've got to recognize that this is not at its core an economic crisis. This is a health crisis. And I think the, the great news is that not only city, but much of the financial system has gone into this from a position of strength. From our, our, our place, it's capital, it's liquidity, it's business model, uh, all of those things. And the investments that we've made in technology and infrastructure um, so far have served us really well. You had a front row seat the last time around, Mike. Are there mistakes that Citigroup made during the financial crisis that, that as a result you're able to avoid this time? Well, I think one is if you look at, at our company, our bank today, you know, we describe ourselves as a, a simpler, stronger institution today. And that when you look at the things we do, I think we've uh, very much um, focused our business around uh, two key, our institutional and our consumer business. And again, we've simplified what we do. So we go into this, I think from a position of strength of not only capital liquidity, I think, but of sanctity of business model and, uh, and the commitments that we have to our customers and clients. I note, you know, a, 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 a perhaps a reluctance, Mike, to, to sort of fully embrace this idea that it's, we're going to be back in business and that, everything's going to be fine. You know, you, you talked a few weeks ago about discounting a V-shaped recovery and being unsure of whether it was going to be U-shaped, W-shaped, L-shaped. What are you thinking right now? It's not about a date, right? It's not about setting a date. And I tell our employees all the time, you're not going to wake up one morning or go to bed one evening with a blast email saying, tomorrow's the day, come back. That we're taking a very granular approach to this as a global company. Again, as we, as we look at this pandemic, it's uneven in, in its nature in every sense, right? It didn't start at the same time. It hasn't spread at the same rate. We've seen varied healthcare responses. We've seen varied economic and policy responses to it. And therefore, not just in the US, but around the world, there's gonna be a varied pace of recovery from this. And I think as that, from City's perspective, we're gonna take a very granular approach around the data and what that data tells us. Clearly, Mike, one of the hardest decisions a CEO has to make is when to bring people back to work. Are they going back to the rural desks? Are they going to some new space in the suburbs? Um, will employees be expected to travel or is, I don't know, Zoom the next business class ticket? So I think one is, is that uh, our business model, Eric, has given us some real advantages. And that is that, you know, clearly uh, we've been in Asia, we've been in Asia a long time. And our colleagues there, I think, gave us great insight, right? As we saw and we, we knew that it was likely COVID would be coming West, we had the ability to have the learnings on the ground of what was happening in Asia, what was working and what wasn't. And if you go back and look at the record, I think we were pretty early movers in terms of some of the decisions we made. Overarching since then, it's all been about the health and safety of our people in terms of making sure that we could 
do everything within our power to ensure that. And so again, as we start to think about returning people to the office, it's gonna be driven by data, as I said, it's likely to be slow, it's likely to be granular, so it will be site by site. And in fact, within those sites, it'll be job by job. And uh, again, I think the great news is that the investments that we've made in technology along the way and the efficacy of which remote working uh, has, has worked for us, um, I think it's nice to have that flexibility. And again, if you look at the things that we've done remotely, it's been truly extraordinary uh, you know, in terms of lending, in terms of holding our annual uh, shareholders meeting, of closing our books uh, to report earnings in nine days, uh, of the, the things that we've been able to do for our customers and clients, and, and by the way, the things that we've been able to do for the communities that, that we serve uh, in terms of giving back. I know it's data driven. You've been very clear about that, but give me your best guess, Mike. When will you start putting people back into your global headquarters in downtown Manhattan? It's all about, can we bring these people in and keep them safe? And I, I think the protocols that we've been working on, uh, and again, it's not simply about a desk or a turret or an office. It's about coming through the turnstile. It's about the cafeteria. It's about the elevators. It's about all of those things that are there that you've got to make sure are safe. And then the, the bigger challenge is actually, I don't think are in phase one. I think it's as, as you continue to bring more people back and densify, how do you actually scale those protocols to, to be able to keep that safety? And what about opening up say satellite locations outside New York City or outside London, for example, for the people who live in the suburbs and, yeah. and don't feel comfortable getting on a commuter train we're taking the subway. I would say candidly, Eric, that the conversations that I'm having are much more about the commute in urban areas. It's getting on the train, it's getting on the subway, uh, it's getting on the bus, um, and it's probably less about the workspace because, again, I think there are things that we can do to create that environment. And I think the biggest hurdle we're going to have to get by is not getting people to come to the, to, to, to operate in the office, it's getting them to the office. Is putting traders back on the trading floor priority? Um, listen, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk in terms of companies saying that people never need to or will return to work. I, I'm very comfortable saying at City that's not who we are. We are very happy to continue to imagine and reimagine as we go forward the ways we come to work. But you know, at our, at our core, we are a client-facing, client-driven business. When we come back, the economic shutdown is putting stress on borrowers around the globe. How Mike Corbett is thinking about the risk of credit losses. The calculations and the modeling that we do remains very sensitive to unemployment, it remains very sensitive to GDP, to housing prices. And so as we continue to look at what we think the future trajectories are of those, we'll continue to make appropriate decisions around reserving into the future. Watching a Bloomberg Front Row interview special, I'm Eric Schatzker. Citigroup CEO Mike Corbett is doing what he can to support companies and consumers during the pandemic. His bank was among the first to defer loan payments. The big question is how long the government can keep the economy from cratering. I think this time what we've really seen is our government entities really focus on business, small business, and in particular jobs and trying to keep people in their jobs and trying to keep people on payrolls. And so while we've put these forbearance programs in place and roughly a million and a half have asked, probably about half of those have actually taken advantage of it to date. And that's fine, the programs are there and we will continue with those programs as long as they are necessary. And I think the, the big question here is how long does this go on and what types of programs. We've heard uh, from our Federal Reserve Chairman that the Federal Reserve is willing to do uh, paraphrasing whatever it takes. And so obviously that's a, a, a pretty good um, uh, lift or, or that provides a lot of buoyancy under some pretty challenging situations. 
But the big question goes back to the unknown and how long does this go on? Mike, whatever it takes raises a couple of important questions, at least a couple for people who play as key a role in the financial system as you do and as Citigroup does more importantly. Uh, it's a trite question, but I'll ask it anyway. Without the promise of infinite Fed liquidity, where would financial markets be today? Where would the stock market be? Would credit spreads be as narrow as they are? Would investment grade bonds be producing a positive return on the year? And as we think about the timeline here, we first saw the Federal Reserve come in and really address liquidity concerns in the market. And we had some pretty challenging days there in terms of price action, in terms of volatility, uh, in terms of asset pricing. Uh, we then, as the Fed put its programs in place, and again, if you, if you look at the actual numbers, I think the, the promise or the, um, the um, creation of those programs themselves without necessarily heavy, heavy utilization has provided that safety net or provided that comfort that people have wanted without the Fed actually having to use significant amounts of, that do of those dollars. Second piece was around credit, right? And we saw in March that uh, from our own perspective in the US system, loan demand spiking up, revolvers being drawn, companies understandably wanting to build liquidity. And I think as part of that, we saw the Federal Reserve step in and put programs uh, in place around those money, uh, money market, commercial paper programs, et cetera. And again, without necessarily heavy utilization, that underlying comfort has uh, provided a base to the market. Uh, and now we've seen them move to the third leg to me, which again goes back to really business, small business, lending, payroll protection, and trying to keep people in jobs. So it's very hard to say specifically because there's so many prongs uh, to, what's, to what's in there, but without a doubt, it has uh, created or um, certainly put the market in a, in a much better position than it would have been without. Mike, walk me through some of your thinking about the longer term cost and consequences of these programs, because those are real too, right? The addiction to Fed liquidity, and, and that dates back to before the pandemic, by the way, um, the mushrooming deficit, right, to, to a scale heretofore almost never seen, certainly not in post-war history, the enormity of the Fed's balance sheet. Well, I think there's a few aspects to it, Eric. I think one is, and, and we're very conscious too, is that you know we don't want to see consumer, small business, big business come out of this in a indebtedness position that's just unsustainable. And that's why I think you've seen in a number of these programs that they've been structured in a way that they're actually grants or have aspects of forgiveness in them provided the monies are used appropriately. And so the government's thinking about the same thing. We don't wanna to end up with an economy where uh, our, our consumers and our business are just saddled with untenable levels of debt. I think the second piece which you touch on is actually where do the governments come out? And I think we've got to be mindful that going while going into this, uh, the US from a position of strength in terms of the economy, growth rates, employment, um, from a monetary and a fiscal perspective, not without some challenges, right? When you think of the toolbox out there, not just in the US, but around the world, low rates, negative rates, in some places. And so not a lot of things on the monetary front that can necessarily uh, be used with high, high impact today, which leads us to fiscal and the fiscal programs being put in place in terms of small business lending and payroll protection and Main Street lending programs that are out there. And that clearly will take up the levels or as some people would say, balloon the Fed's balance sheet. And by the way, other balance sheets. And we've got to be mindful that we do not want uh, our government in the U.S. or other governments to come out in a position where the debt at the at this the government level, the federal level, is is untenable because again we're likely to be in this slower growth environment for an extended period of time, and we've got to make sure that we've created that balance in terms of people continuing to have confidence in terms of not just the U.S. government but governments around the world. So in your mind, how does the government exit? We're going to have to start to chip away at the mountain of debt that, that, that we've created as a result of doing the right things to fight this crisis. We've been in this extended period 
of fairly lax or easy monetary policy. And if you go back and look at the Fed balance sheet uh, coming out of the last financial crisis, they were on a path, on a trajectory of getting that back down to, I think, levels that people were becoming much more comfortable with. Obviously, with this, we've had to go back in the other direction. And as we uh, try to get to the other side of this and hopefully come out in the not too distant future, um, it's going to be back on the table. But as you, you cite, you know, a couple of things that are out there is that one is the U.S. does continue to be the world's preeminent reserve currency. And, you know, when you look at our treasury auctions and others, it has a very strong international borrowing base and therefore has capacity. Uh, I think the, the second piece of it, and, and I don't want to be lulled into a false sense of complacency, but the low interest rates impose a very low cost in terms of the U.S. government borrowing to be able to fund these programs that are out there. When we come back, Mike Corbett wants to expand Citigroup's business in Asia, but that plan is growing more complicated as tensions between the U.S. and China escalate. We've been in Hong Kong uh, a long time as well. Again, over 100 years uh, there. It's an important place for us. It's a, it's a big hub for our business. And listen, I think between um, some of the political challenges and the healthcare challenges, it hasn't been easy, but we, we remain committed to Hong Kong. Welcome back. I'm Eric Schatzker, and this is a Bloomberg Front Row interview special. A decade ago, Citigroup was the poster child for Wall Street recklessness. As CEO Mike Corbett says, the bank is playing a different role this time, helping the government to rescue the economy and mapping out a path to the post-pandemic world. We came into this um, health crisis from a position of strength in terms of capital. You know, we had uh, finishing the year 11.8% uh, tier one common equity capital uh, on our balance sheet. Again, in the support of our clients, we used a bit of that in terms of the first quarter. I think the U.S. system, uh, like City, comes into this from a position of strength. And uh, as part of that, we, in the first quarter, you saw us build uh, again, as a company and as an industry, considerable reserves. We built almost $5 billion of additional reserves. We've got about $23 billion of reserves right now set aside. Uh, and again, we'll continue to watch as we go forward. And as you can imagine, uh, the calculations and the modeling that we do remains very sensitive to unemployment. It remains very sensitive to GDP, to housing prices. And so as we continue to look at what we think the future trajectories are of those, we'll continue to make appropriate decisions around reserving into the future. So uh, again, a position of strength, I think trying to be prudent, smart about it, making sure we're there and the important things to support our clients, but being mindful in terms of capital and capital trajectory into the future. The last time around during the financial crisis or after the financial crisis, it took some 18 months, Mike, before City, City was able to stop building additional reserves for you know, potentially bad loans. Do you think it'll take that long this time? Again, we don't know the trajectory of this, mm. Eric. I, you know, I talked about the, the stages in terms of containment, in terms of stabilization, in terms of normalization, and, and eventually back to growth. And uh, I think in this, stabilization will be an important thing that we actually have gotten through this. And uh, we've been able to, to start to bring things back more towards a norm and not have increases in cases. City Mike has a large and historic business in Asia, but at the same time, a lot less at stake in China than some other foreign banks. I'd like to know if you're reconsidering some of your expansion plans there in light of the tensions and, and I think it's fair to say growing mistrust in the West of China's intentions. Well, you know, Asia, Asia is a place where we've been coming to work for over a century, and it's an important part of our global network. And clearly, China is a, is a big and important piece of that. And again, when you think about the places where we come to work every day and where we're a bank, we don't wake up one day and say, gee, don't we want to be in these places? We listen to the places that are important to our clients and the things that they want to do. 
And I think China is a big economy. It's an important economy. It's an important place for many, many, many of the U.S. multinational companies. And as part of that, we want to make sure that we're there to support them. What about Hong Kong? Would you reconsider your footprint in Hong Kong if the Chinese government goes ahead with laws that appear destined to limit uh, freedom and liberty? So we've been in Hong Kong uh, a long time as well. Again, over a hundred years uh, there. It's an important place for us. It's a, it's a big hub for our business. And listen, I think between um, some of the political challenges and the healthcare challenges, it hasn't been easy, but we, we remain committed to Hong Kong. Uh, Rahm Emanuel famously said, never allow uh, a crisis to go to waste. Uh, something along those lines, Mike. But what's more important is asking you, how are you taking advantage of the opportunities? I would describe them as that only possible because of a crisis like this. I think one of the big things, Eric, that has come out of this is what I would describe as a even faster acceleration of the move to digital. And as a company, we've been making significant investments over the past several years. And by the way, I think it's through this crisis served us extremely well. But when you look at, as an example, our heroes that have uh, continued throughout this every day to go into our branches, branch traffic is down 40 or 50%. Cash usage is down. And so we've seen digital, uh, digital application usage up. And again, not just up around people who have been active users in the past, we're bringing new users in. So to me, I think it's exciting, and I'm sure we're going to get some great lessons and already have in terms of what the future of that is and actually how do we accelerate that. Right? We've known that we've been on this path from analog to digital, and it was tough to, to really discern what that timeline would look like. I think without a doubt, this has accelerated it. And at City, how do we actually get behind that and make sure that we're pushing the things that people really want. And by the way, it's not just in our consumer business, it's in our trading businesses, it's in our transaction service businesses, it's in our private bank, and it's across the board. So again, putting on the table and continuing to imagine and reimagine the ways we come to work and the things that we can do for our customers and clients around the world. So whether it's 12 months from now or five years from now, how are people going to look back on this and say, that's what Citi did differently. That's what Citi did differently from other banks. And that's what Mike Corbett, as a CEO, did differently from other CEOs. What will they say? Well, I, I hope they say, you know, we came into this from a position of strength and then not just as a bank, but from a broader uh, economic perspective, we went out of our way to support. And I'm really proud of what our people have done and the way we've supported our clients but the way we've supported our communities. We've been very active, not just in the US, around the world. Uh, we've already contributed uh, either in dollars or in kind over a hundred million dollars uh, of aid into uh, uh, protective equipment. We've repurposed some of our cafeterias into providing uh, over 35,000 meals in a, in a world where food safety is so critical. And that uh, city went into this strong, they came out of it strong. The investments that they made in their infrastructure uh, served them well, uh, and they are our bank of choice as we go forward. That wraps up our Bloomberg Front Row interview special with Citigroup CEO Mike Corbett. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Television and Radio for continuing coverage of the coronavirus pandemic. And visit Bloomberg.com for the latest news and analysis 24 hours a day. Stay safe. I'm Eric Schatzker. This is Bloomberg.